Good afternoon. My name is Naomi Nelson, and I'm the director of the Rubenstein Rare Book and Manuscript Library. Along with Lou Brown, director of programs for the Forum for Scholars and Publics, I extend a warm welcome to Embracing a Broader Vision, a conversation between historian Wesley Hogan and creator, creator Lana Garland. This is the third in a series of conversations between artists and historians exploring the role of art in creating knowledge and narratives about slavery, the Civil War, and freedom struggles in the United States. It accompanies the exhibition to stand by the side of freedom, Abraham Lincoln and 19th century America on view at the Rubenstein Library through May 14th, 2022. This exhibition shares rare materials from David Rubenstein's personal collection, bringing together his materials on Abraham Lincoln for the first time. And we'll drop a link in the chat to the digital version of this exhibit, and I hope that you can come in person to view it as well. We are grateful to David Rubenstein for sharing his collection and for his generous sponsorship for the exhibition and for this series of events. Other co-sponsors include the Rubenstein Library, the Forum for Scholars and Publics, the Franklin Humanities Institute, the Vice Provost for the Arts, the Department of African and African American Studies, the Department of Art, Art History and Visual Studies, the Department of History, and the MFA EDA program at Duke University. It is my great pleasure to introduce our speakers today. Lana Garland is the festival director and curator of the Haytai Heritage Film Festival and a member of the North Carolina Governor's Advisory Council on Film, Television, and Digital Streaming. She has worked as a filmmaker, creative director, screenwriter, and educator in television and film in the US, Europe, and Africa. Lana has created content for HBO, BET, PBS, and ESPN in America, and TV2 in Denmark. In documentary, she has worked on award-winning content, such as Bowling for Columbine, and HBO's Unchained Memories, Readings from Slave Narratives. Lana is a Fulbright specialist, having taught film at Makere University in Uganda. Wesley Hogan is research professor at the Franklin Humanities Institute and the History Department at Duke University. She writes and teaches the history of youth social movements, human rights, documentary, and oral history. Her two most recent books are On the Freedom Side, which draws a portrait of young people organizing in the spirit of Ella Baker since 1960, and People Power, History Organizing and Larry Goodwin's Democratic Vision in the 21st Century, which she co-edited with Paul Ortiz. Wesley co-facilitates a partnership between the SNCC Legacy Project and Duke. This partnership produced the SNCC Legacy, I'm sorry, the SNCC, Di SNCC Digital Gateway, whose purpose is to bring the grassroots stories of civil rights movements to a much wider public through a web portal, K through 12 initiative and set of critical oral histories. It's my great pleasure to welcome Lana and Wesley to this program and I look forward to hearing it. Thank you. Thanks so much, Naomi. So good to be with you all today. I wanna to welcome everybody who's with us and wanna especially thank Lou and Naomi for putting together this wonderful series. I've enjoyed the first two programs immensely. But today I am thrilled to welcome Lana Garland. Lana, thank you so much for being here today to allow us to explore this magnificent body of work. Over three decades, your wide ranging and accessible work as a screenwriter, producer, filmmaker, curator, editor, educator, photographer, and festival director is simply astonishing to me in its breadth and its depth. So as we move through the hour, I'll ask those gathered here with us today to share questions you have for Ms. Garland in the Q&A to make sure we leave adequate space for those questions. Um, but Lana, as we turn back to you, you've been this key maker, curator, and creator of our public memory through films and television, through the Haytai Film Festival, and through your work as an educator. I feel like this memory work takes on a particularly powerful resonance right now in this moment where we face a past that many political operatives are trying to literally empty of our inherited knowledge. But you, in fact, are a creator and connector of intergenerational knowledge that is so multifaceted. So I'm really grateful that you're here to share at the start a few clips of recent film and screenwriting work. And so before we get started with that first clip from your feature documentary, Passing On, what would you like us to know about this work? Uh, well, The Passing On is a, a film that was directed by my dear friend, uh, Nathan Clark. 
Um, and I am the producer, one of the producers on the film. Um, I guess I want you to know about the film that it is about the uh, African American tradition of mortuary science and funerals. And so uh, when I still worked at the Southern Documentary Fund, uh, we took on a project of Nate's and it was called We All Die. And so he came to us one day and said, listen, I don't want to, and it was a survey film, a film about uh, the death and, and dying across the nation. And so at some point he came across this funeral home in San Antonio. And so he came to us and said, I don't want to do the old project. I've got this new project and, and let me show you some things. And I started to watch it. And, you know, kind of, uh, it's almost like uh, the experience of somebody showing you family photos. They don't know that you're family, but somebody showing you family photos. And so almost immediately, I, I, I felt a certain amount of uh, uh, connection to this project. And so uh, I guess Nate felt that we're kindred spirits. And so we started talking about the project. Ultimately, I I had left uh, the Southern Documentary Fund and then he called me and said, Lana, you got to come on as a producer. And so that's what happens. So what yeah. you have today is the trailer for The Passing On. Okay, so let's take a look. So you scared of hard work? No, not scared of hard work, just like you said, it's a new day. You want to walk in on E yeah, street. Yeah, it's a new day, a new time. That's good. Everybody want to do their own thing now. I mean, we need some young people. But the, the Lord of Brussels gonna will be all right. You gonna look at the Spurs tonight? Who they playing? When we read Psalm 51, David repented. What? What are we doing here? Because we mess up, amen? I'm doing your will and your way, God, but it seems like every time I get forward, I get pushed backwards. I've actually seen my mother shed tears and ask me, what is it going to take for you to do right? So being a producer on a film can take so many different shapes. And this is such a thoughtful portrait of this fundamental part of African-American culture through the lens of intergenerational transmission. And I'm just curious what your work as a producer looked like on this particular film. Yes, yeah, so um, that's a conversation because, um, you know, in this day and age of this conversation around who gets to tell the story, you know, that can be a very fraught conversation. And what I mean by that is that, you know, traditionally people think of uh, the director as the person who holds the creative and the story and the producer, the person who uh, makes things happen, uh, meaning, you know, the logistics of a shoot and the processing of paperwork. But uh, my role in this particular project is as a creative producer. So, when you're a creative producer, that means that you are deeply invested in uh, story structure and and um, kind of the underpinnings of culture. The, so uh, making sure that uh, we are, and, and my role specifically was making sure that we are um, beholden to the culture from which it comes. And so uh, Nate was very, very, um, conscious of that. And so we had so many conversations about that because like I said, it, as you know, it's a big conversation in doc right now. 
you know, with this practice of white makers telling stories of, of black and brown people. And Nate Clark is a white maker. Uh, so, you know, I being, you know, somewhat of a, a leader in, in, in documentary, um, I had to really kind of challenge myself. But um, what I did not know at the time was that this conversation is evolving. So as this conversation evolves, uh, we're ev evolving. And so Nate and I had to have the really, really tough conversations around, well, what does that mean when you say you want to be totally observational, for example? Um, that's part of the kind of the intricacies of kind of telling stories of marginalized people. The observational framework may or may not work within a larger context uh, because everything is context. Everything has to be contextualized. And so we had to have some difficult conversations, but we landed in this space where um, I was so very pleased to be able to hold this work with him and also uh, another comrade of ours, Tyler Trumbo. Um, we just developed a way of being a way of talking so that um, it was kind of uh, respected, it, the, the work was respected, everybody's role in creating the work had to be really, really fluid. And so uh, because of that, we had to kind of approach it from the stance of everybody kind of had to have some type of ownership in the, in the storytelling and storage structure. So you're being really modest, but for the people on the who are part of the conversation today, I think it's important to talk about what you mean when you say he wanted it to be, Nate wanted it to be just observational. And I was saying, no, that's not going to work in this context. And I bring this up because the exhibit of the Abraham Lincoln um, artifacts is also a, you know, a challenging one because there, we simply don't have the same kind of documentary record from the right. perspective of African-Americans in that emancipation and um, immediate uh, reconstruction period. Mm -hmm. So I think this national leadership work that you're doing in documentary is really important to lift up. So do you mind just talking briefly before, I wanna make sure we have time for the clip. So we're, we'll, we'll move into those clips shortly, but do you mind just sharing a bit about that conversation with Nate when he said, well, I'm approaching this as observational and you said, hmm. Well, yeah, well, I explained to him about how, um, you know, that with observational storytelling, it assumes you come with a, a set of assumptions about who's going to be able to hold the information in a particular way. Um, and to be even more to drill down on that, you know, I, I don't think he really, he didn't know that, for example, this particular profession uh, was so pivotal pivotal to um, who we were as, as a community. I mean, for me personally, the, the, the mortician's kids were the ones who had the swimming pool, you know? So they were traditionally the, the, the people who had access to resources because they were entrepreneurs, they had raised money and they were doing well within the community. And so we relied upon them for, you know, people may borrow money from them, or if people didn't have uh, money to bury a loved one, you know, there had to be this type of negotiation that they were always open to. I mean, and their involvement in the civil rights movement was vast. So um, it's a very, very specific uh, relationship to this group of people. And once he became aware of that, you know, we had to tell that story because most people uh, outside of the black community don't know. And in the black community, it's almost like the things that you don't know that you don't know, because I had always taken it for granted that they would always be there. But here mm -hmm. we are. And, you know, those institutions are going away. And I did not know this until he stepped into my office and said, look at this footage. Wow, thank you so much for that. So we're gonna look at a little bit of some shorter work. So three short pieces, um, two of which you've done recently um, for ESPN and the third with students at Central that is a at North Carolina Central that is a multimedia project. And I think all three projects 
reflect not only your deep knowledge of history, but it reflects your love of what you called bringing the past into a modern context. So what do you want us to know before we look at these three short pieces? Uh, well, the first, the first one is a project for BET's uh, Black History Month campaign. It was a campaign with Janet Jackson. So there were a series of 10 of those. So all historical uh, figures. Um, and then the ESPN was also a campaign where I was a creative director. And so there were other directors on other spots. So that was a series of maybe six. And so uh, this one, uh, in, in this particular clip, uh, I didn't tell you this before, but it features my, my nephew, Scott Bandora. So that, that little boy is my nephew. <laughs> and so the, the last one is Blues Women. And Blues Women was created with my dear friend and, and constant collaborator, uh, Professor Dr. Lenora, uh, Zenzele Helm Hammonds. Uh, I use all the notes. So I've known her since New York and now I know her because she teaches at NCCU. And so I had to use, you know, I had to go through that entire Lenora Zenzele Helm Hammond. So uh, she created and we created this project called Blues Women and it premiered for the first time at Aaron Davis Hall in New York City. And at first in that iteration, it was made for the public school system to introduce kids to blues women. And so it's evolved over time. And so whenever we go into a community, we kind of tailor make it for that community. So that last piece, blues women, what you'll see is um, we worked with the NCCU vocal jazz ensemble students. And so they were kind of uh, giving a, a telling of how they felt about uh, Strange Fruit, the Billie Holiday song. Thank you so much for that context. So I'm gonna go ahead and share. Wife, mother, nurse, an escaped slave who became a Union Army soldier, scout, spy. And in the end, she had to fight for a military pension as hard as she had to fight for her country. Maybe they had a hard time figuring out a woman's worth. Do you know Harriet Tubman? Black history, pass it on. In celebration of black history, ESPN presents Free to Be. My team is mostly African-American. Sometimes when we play other teams, they won't shake our hands. It's okay, because we know it was much worse for guys like Jackie Robinson. But we play hard and earn respect. Now, teams want to come here to play us. Game on. <laughs> Billie Holiday's recording of Strange Fruit. Yes. Oh, I was thinking that. I don't really know who was talking about that. I think we should all talk about that. Ah, I was sorry. thinking about that. Strange Fruit is one of the most potent pieces mm -hmm. I've ever heard to this day yeah. about the struggle of um, blacks in the South. Pastoral scene of the gallant South. The bulging eyes and the twisted mouth. Scent of magnolia, sweet and fresh. Then the sudden smell of burning flesh. Here is a fruit for the crows to pluck, for the rain to gather. Mm, 
Mm. So particularly in Blues Woman, in this last multimedia project, the way you position nature in juxtaposition to Billie Holiday's song, Strange Fruit, and to the young people in, in nature is incredibly potent. And nature emerges as a theme in so much of your work. In spring 2020, in the early months of the pandemic, you wrote a beautiful and evocative call to healing in a piece for Duke Arts. And you talked about Harriet Tubman there. You said, quote, the celestial beacon of hope for the escaped Harriet represented more than a compass to the north. It represented the interdependence between humans and the natural world, becoming at one with nature, understanding its patterns and its rules, like Harriet ultimately leads to wisdom and freedom. I and many in my community am thinking more about the land and the planet than ever before. And I just wonder if you might talk a little bit about how you see nature functioning in your in this wide body of work, screenwriting, filmmaking, the curation work. I think that uh, this is something that I've arrived upon uh, since moving to Durham in 2011. And so it's something that wasn't always there, but I definitely uh, point back to kind of uh, conversations of those who have been on this land. Um, one of my teachers and dear friends, uh, Justin Robinson, has taught me so much about the land and the connection between the people and the land. And so uh, one thing I'm very, very clear of now is that there's been a breach and that breach happened because of the trauma that we went through as a people um, through slavery. And when the great migration happened and we left the South and we went you know, to the North and beyond, um, we left that behind. And I can remember conversations growing up about you know, people either uh, not wanting to be Black people, family members and friends, not wanting to be out in nature. It was something kind of looked down upon. It was something that you should be afraid of. And I've always held, um, you know, my, I, I've, you know, people tease me because for the longest time I, I never wanted to go camping. And I feel like there is this um, thing that I can't shake regarding strange fruit. That's why I can't, I, I don't camp. I feel, uh, you know, I feel the, I've got that information buried somewhere at the base of my cerebral cortex. Um, as Francis Cress Welsing says, where I rem I I feel what my ancestors went through in terms of the lynchings and the kind of juxtaposition of that beauty in nature and um, our demise. Um, knowing the lick of the lash happened in these types of environments. So, at this point in time there is a need, I believe, for reclamation. And that reclamation is happening because of climate change. It's happening because of food insecurity. It's happening because of housing insecurity. And so there's a need to heal that now. So it's not something that I've walked with always, but it's something that has been foremost in, in, my, in my mind now um in working with justin on a tv show in development called the land of fish and grits uh, i tell the story about how um they were going to a hog killing and i said i'm not going to go uh, at the time i was vegetarian and i just didn't want to see that and so they brought the footage back and i'm screening the footage and it is simply gorgeous and it's gorgeous because you have generations of uh an african-american family who are um, respectfully processing livestock and being on the land. And um, it never occurred to me that there was a way to do that, to be able to kind of be a good steward of the land and, and in a way that wasn't, you know, um, extractive. Mm. So um, it told me a lot about the differences in my family. My grandfather was from the South. He was from Virginia. My father was born and, ra and raised in, in Philadelphia. And those two clashed. And that's because um, land means everything. 
land holds culture. And so the definition of manhood in Virginia being on the land is different from the definition of manhood in Philadelphia. And so I then kind of thought of Isabel Wilkerson and the, the warmth of other sons and all of those stories that talk about what happened when we migrated, but you know, we've forgotten about what we left behind. Mm -hmm. And so being in the South, it, can, it reconnects me to that, to that place of what did we leave behind? And I think that's so important for us to take on now. And I found out that 45 minutes from where I live, is the Garland Buford house. My, my people were here and I never knew mm -hmm. that before. And so that is more than coincidence for me. That's a calling. And so that's why I kind of um, must work nature and the land back into kind of any type of narrative storytelling that I do from henceforth. Mm, and I'm so grateful that you are willing to share with us today in two different formats, sort of what this incredibly fertile and creative mind of yours has now created with this bringing forward these themes that you just referenced. So this might be a good segue to the clip of the recent screenplay Sojourner and the, and the proof of concept piece we're about to see. Can you just, is there anything you want to say before we go ahead and screen it? Yes, uh, Sojourner um, is something that I came up with because when I when I first moved here, I was so happy to, to see that Stagville ex existed. I had never been to a plantation before and I had this curiosity and I went there and I, I fell in love with the place. And I know some people have issues around that in the African-American community. Some people say, how can you go to a plantation? It held so much pain. And I feel like, how could I leave my ancestors behind? And so Sackville is, is a very special place for me. And then I got the um, opportunity to see the work of Mike Wiley, an amazing actor here in North Carolina. And so I said, I had to write something specifically for Mike and that pointed specifically to Stagville. So Stagville becomes Sojourner. So this is um, Sojourner Plantation and the story is about a time traveling slave. Wonderful. And I'm just going to alert the audience to the fact that I'm going to have to back up a minute just because I, I went a little bit over with the last clip. So give me just a sec to back this up. Dearest Lisa, I hope you and my boy are in good health by the time this letter reaches you. In the last letter, you said my poor little girl had taken a turn for the worst. She'd gone on to be with the Lord. I hope our boy is okay. This tore me up so bad I couldn't hide it from my new wife. When she found out about you, she fell over. She said the same thing had happened to her. She too has another family on another plantation. I, just, I tried and tried to love her. And she me. But my love for you will never falter. Climate change is not just happening in the Arctic, but it's beginning to show up in our own backyards. More than 15,000 scientists are sounding an alarm about climate change. I will find you, and my son. I am Dante Sojourner. I am Dante Sojourner. Hi. I am Dante Sojourner. So magnificent and important. And I'm so grateful that you have allowed us to do a screen read today. Do you want to tell us a little bit about it before we start? Yes. Uh, well, 
This particular scene that we're going to read today, uh, it takes place. So um, you just saw uh, Dante Sojourner, time travels from the days of slavery to now. And so what's happened is he's arrived at Sojourner Plantation. Uh, they see him talking to a class about the land and his encyclopedic knowledge of plants and, and crops. And so they are taken by him, but they think he's just this performer who's come up with this narrative. And so they hire him uh, to work at the plantation, at the, uh, well, it's no longer Sojourner Plantation, but pretty similar to uh, Stagville, it's basically a museum. And so um, he is hiding the fact that, you know, he's more than just, you know, a, a performer and uh, the scene that we're going to see, it is the first time that he is performing uh, his piece that he does, and he sees the woman who used to be his wife from the days of slavery. So she's reincarnated into the present day. And so uh, we had today two amazing actors who are also colleagues of mine at the Haiti Heritage Center. We have Quentin Talley who is the program director at Haiti, and John Nyere Frazier, who is the assistant program director at Haiti. Wonderful, and I'll be reading, um, Lana, tell me what I call this in screenwriting terms. What am I reading? What parts am I reading? Uh, oh, see, you're, you're reading the log lines, you're, the descriptions, let's just call it that. Okay. Scene from Sojourner, written by Lana Garland, Spoken word by Quentin Talley. Where is, when is John up on, we need John on screen. Okay, there we are. Hi guys. Hey. Hey. Okay. Interior, Maple Grove Country Club, ballroom, day, present day. Dante Sojourner, a muscular African-American man in his late forties is surrounded by tables filled with people in black tie attire, a stark contrast to his field hand clothes. Plates and glasses clink as people eat from fine china and sip from wine flutes. Dante steps to the mic, a little overwhelmed. Ladies and gentlemen, my name is Dante Sojourner. I was born on this land, I likely die on this land. Tobacco used to grow right where you're sitting now, as this used to be a part of Sojourner Plantation, a place where my wife, place where my wife and child were taken from me. Behind a curtain, we see Amaka, a 60-ish elegant black woman, hair coiffed, shades on, and a long gown suitable for both a dinner party and a Star Trek episode. She looks to Junie, an African-American man in his late 30s. Get ready, just in case. Keep your head low and your barrels high. That's what they used to say to us slaves. We was machines trying to keep white folks happy survive just long enough to get a bit of happiness in this lifetime. Seeing y'all tonight, white folks sitting next to black folks, others, my mind can't barely hold a sight. How far we've come. Back then, me knowing about plants was the only thing kept me safe. Master Garland is, was a botanist. And he liked me because I was the only one that he could talk to about the things that he really liked. Still, when he had no need for me, he kept me in the fields from sun up to sundown, which I already know already about that. And I've seen some of your, your history books. Yes, I can read and write. The master needed me to log plants in his books. He learned me, although it was against the law. It was the only time. I Feel good about myself. Well, until I met my wife, Flora, smart, always standing up for, for people as best she could. If it wasn't for, for. Dante sees someone in the audience, awkward silence. The audience turns to look for what Dante is looking at. Cut to Milton, Dante's best friend, and another slave from the plantation as he walks from the back of the room to take a seat at the table. He's looking stylish in his tux, and when he pulls out his chair, he kisses the forehead of the woman seated next to him. 
It is a present day flora. If it wasn't for my family. Here we go. And, and my friends. Dante is losing it. I mean, that's all we had to live for, really. Getting angry. Who did you trust? Nobody? As much as we tried to stay together, us slaves was always scared, frightened for our lives, and started backstabbing and lying. From out of nowhere wails the vocals, Gnarls Barkley style. I remember when, I remember, I remember when I lost my mind. Sick. My boy nowhere to be found after she died. There was something so pleasant about that place. My rage. My rage and sadness took over. And I guess that's why I'm here now. Because it makes you crazy. I got to go. Junie gets between Dante and the mic. People applaud, thinking this is part of the performance. Junie begins a spoken word reading with music. Enjoy yourself this day, for who knows when the hour will come to receive an honorable congratulations. The voice from which conversation comes from spoke gently as a familiar stranger. Dante stumbles to the back with a maca. He sits. Listen, get yourself together before you get too upset. Milton and Flora, why didn't you tell me? You are here for a purpose. Calm down or you're going to shift. His body begins to shake. What, what, what's happening? I need you to stay with me. I, I don't know. Amaka grabs him, but his body evaporates. Damn it. Exterior, forest, day. Dante transports back to the exact moment he left during the old times, being chased by the patty rollers. Shotguns ring through the air. Dante stumbles and falls, fade to black. And scene. <laughs> Thank you guys. Thank no you so much, Mr. Frazier and Mr. Talley. And just a reminder to those in the audience with us today, please add questions you have for Ms. Garland to the chat. I'm so excited and grateful for this incredible variety of work you've been able to share with us today. And as I think through the early 90, 1990s work um, and early 2000s, the film that you worked on, Stolen Moments, Red Hot and Cool, which brought together jazz and hip hop musicians to alert people to the dangers of HIV, or the incredibly powerful Unchained Memories in 2002, where some of the world's most gifted actors read the words of freed people who'd spent part of their childhood enslaved, or this recent work you just shared with us just now here in Sojourner. These themes of freedom, emancipation, and connection among generations emerge so beautifully and powerfully. So can you talk a little bit uh, with us about what draws you to those themes? Yes, I think, um... When I first found out about slavery, I, I guess I was around, I guess, four or five, and I just felt as though I was going to have to go back at some point. And so it's just been kind of just this strange kind of occurrence for me, and it's just uh, intrigued me. And so, you know, it's just one of those things that stayed with me my, my entire life, but then at the same time, these projects would just kind of gravitate towards me. Um, I, you know, for for readings from the slave narratives, uh, Jackie Glover, uh, who was at HBO, I had just come off of Bowling for Columbine, and she said, will you come in and produce on uh, readings from the slave narratives? And I was like, of course. And, I've, and so these kinds of projects kind of find me. And mm -hmm. so I used to feel like it was something that I kind of wanted to try and get away from. But then once I stepped more fully into the fact that, it, you know, there's this connection between that era and and my psyche, then I just allowed for it to happen. And just I've learned so much and beautiful things have happened as a result of that. 
Yeah, I'm particularly thinking about just the incredible variety. If we just think about the um, pass it on Black History moment for ESPN, many BET. people could have, I'm sorry. The, That's BET. For BET. Mm -hmm. um, when you say, you know, here's, here's what Jackie Robinson did, some people might have left it there, but instead you connect it to today in this beautiful way through this young person. And so there's that kind of connection. And then most literally in Sojourner, where people are, or at least Dante is moving through time to connect today's era to that period right before emancipation. And I, I find it just an extraordinary and evocative body of work that, that I haven't seen anyone else move in those spaces. So I know that you might have initially been like, why is this coming to me? But I'm so grateful that you've stayed with it and now have produced this magnificent screenplay and proof of concept. It's just so exciting. So, um, well, I, well, I think that the ancestors were, were asking for that in a way. I feel like that is more of when things happen like that, I think that's more of a ancestral calling, you know? And so now that I'm of a certain age, I know that when those things happen, you kind of have to honor it. And life mm -hmm. becomes better when you do. Um, and, you know, also thinking about Washerwoman and, and um, you know, Washerwoman is, is a project that I've been working on for a while and it's taken, it's shape shifted into different things. And I feel like I feel so much um, respect and responsibility to tell a story that is worthwhile of those women who did that type of work, women who used to take in the wash Mm -hmm. um now that those women are no longer here they're really really you really can't find them anymore so it, it becomes about you know how can you tell this story because once again similarly to the passing on it's a profession that's going by the wayside washer women don't exist anymore you know we've got laundromats and these other things and so is it a story that we've missed? And so finding the, the, the way into that is, um, I, I feel like, you know, at some point that project will be done, but I feel like it's daunting because I feel such a love and respect for the work that those women did. Uh, that's the work that my, my Nana, my great grandmother, Marie Sojourner did. Mm. Well, you might not know this either, but I, I, when I was doing a little bit of the research for today, I noticed that people on four continents have, you've influenced with washerwomen. So I found a, a Chinese author who's a playwright who's been deeply influenced by this when he was looking at bringing a similar story about um, Chinese washerwomen in Mississippi um, into being. Um, people that you've worked with in Europe and Africa and here in the U.S. have all been deeply influenced by these conversations, extended conversations over years that they've had with you about this multimedia project, which at different times has included um, the amazing, you know, Grammy-winning uh, vocalist Nina Freelon and um, um, artist Maya Sante. And I mean, there's just so many people that you've brought together for different iterations of that. So um, even though it hasn't necessarily manifested in all the ways that you've liked yet, I hope you can take that in that that's, you know, it's spread to four continents, the, the conceptualization and the, the incredible importance of the work. Absolutely. There, there isn't a community that doesn't kind of resonate with this. So, you know, I'm waiting for that time to just be still enough to be able to kind of envision what this is supposed to be because uh, I point to my friends, my, uh, my friend Maria Setio, who was of Italian American extraction. And she found me and she said, Lana, she did this whole campaign, washerwomen vote. And so she talks about her grandmother and when her grandmother came over from Italy and did that kind of work. I talked to women um in the netherlands uh who are here in north carolina who talk about seeing you know the 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 lines of of wash you know mm -hmm. <laughs> over the tulips <laughs> and so women across the board uh resonate with this project in india when we talk about what was the caste system which you know people debate about whether or not it's still there or not the lowest of the caste were the washerwomen 
we talk in, we're in Nigeria, you know, where you have these uh, petrochemical companies, you know, mining oil, and uh, there are protests, and some of the protests are, you know, clotheslines and people hanging clothes over these pools of burning uh, oil fields. So uh, it's ubiquitous. And so I feel the immense gravity of being able to not only tell the, the global story, but also the story of my people. And so they'll tell me at some point how I need to kind of, because I've, I've, over the years, I've collected a lot of different narratives about it. And so I, I, it will come to me soon. I trust that maybe mm -hmm. even this year. Um, so we're getting some questions starting to roll in. And I wanted to say that a lot of people are really excited and grateful for um, Mr. Talley, Mr. Frazier, and this beautiful screenplay. Um, but we have a few questions. I want to make sure we have a little bit of time to talk about your really powerful and um, nationally impactful leadership of Haiti. Um, and maybe we can combine this a little bit um, with a question that came in from another really powerful Southern storyteller, Kamal Pope. Mm -hmm. And so Kamal says, thank you for this space. This is amazing. In our time together, we've explored and highlighted liberatory methods, practices, and actions that Lana Garland takes in her work. It has been beautiful to witness. How did Lana develop this praxis of justice, storytelling, and liberation over time? And what lessons did she learn along her career to get her to the space we share today? I guess I would start with uh, one of my, one of the things that uh, I like to do is to listen to people. Um, I'm fascinated by people. Uh, the, and, and so being able to kind of sit with folks and just hear their stories, that's enough to propel me into the work that I do. Uh, so it came somewhat, um, it was just a natural evolution. Uh, once I started the practice of being out in the field and interviewing folks, um, it just kind of never stopped. But the interesting thing about that practice, if we want to talk about practices, is that when you're constantly in the space of listening to the stories of others, you forget to tell your story. You forget to invert that. And so at some point that becomes very, very important. So I had to begin to start training myself to tell the story of, of me and my people. Um, the writing was always there. Um, it started when, you know, in New York. And once again, you know, I guess so going back to this idea of practice, listening and being being able to hear not only the call within you but also uh, being able to understand what people and i mean your familiars not just any old folk but pe people who are your familiars will tell you who you are too and so um early on people told me that i was a writer and so I had been doing that work as a writer producer at, at HBO, but then when I segued into the narrative, it became about, well, what kinds of stories are you going to tell? And so it's always about my people. Um, but, um, you know, I'm always cognizant of, and this is for a documentary and a narrative of, alike, to be able to kind of drill down into the African Americans uh, experience so deeply that you find the humanity that then points back to everybody. And so that was a, another conversation I had with Nate on the passing on. You know, at some point, mm -hmm. uh, Nate said to me, um, well, Lana, I kind of want to make this story for everybody. So I'm not so sure we really want to get too far down into the nitty gritty of of kind of what happened in the past. And, mm -hmm. and so then I said to him, and he tells me this all the time, he said my, his, his favorite line from me is that art is specific. Good art is specific. And so it requires that you drill down all the way because once you do that, that's where the humanity comes. And so that is kind of, uh, that's, the, that's the ground I stand on. So I'm always trying to find ways to drill down even more. 
And what we've heard in the doc space, we use this phrase quite a bit, complicate the narrative. We're always talking about complicating the narrative because once we complicate the narrative, it means that human beings are much more than just black or white or queer, queer or uh, non-binary or you know whatever we can come up with. There are so many different iterations of that thing that we call human uh, that to be able to get to really, really good storytelling and good work requires that you drill down into all of that. So I noticed that in that description of the very specific component of your art practice, mm -hmm. um, one of the things that jumped out to me was the soundtrack. And Kamau has a follow-up question around that. So is asking what's the role that music offers in Lana's storytelling and how does she make those choices? Mm -hmm. So I don't know if you wanna kind of weave in some of the specific musical choices that um, you're making when you're when you're creating a piece? I would say that uh, it sits with me, you know, so um, one of the practices is definitely being able to expose yourself to all music and, and what I mean by all, not necessarily all music, but a lot of different types of music influences. I definitely am a child of, I was a child in the, you know, R&B tradition of the 70s. So that that can be a starting place. In fact, my very, very first short film, it started with uh, a Nina Simone song, but then that I, I had to allow for that to evolve. So that song created the, the storyline, but I did not use that in the piece. It, it informed the narrative of the story. And so it's, um, it's important to really figure out what you like and why you like it. Uh, but music is everything. And so, you know, that the choice to not use music or any other type of background sound with a Janet Jackson becomes obvious. It's like this person who's known for music doesn't need a soundtrack underneath. Mm. You know, um, the words are the soundtrack. You know, the, the being able to tune into her and get the little quirks, you know, the little things like maybe you maybe she didn't know the woman's worth, you know, that that intention around the, the spirit of the thing is is really important. So uh, that's what we do as creatives. We have to kind of know who we are in terms of our relationship with music and just um, and, and so, for example, the gnarl, using the Gnarls Barkley song um you know it's it it was a it was a sort of interrupter of sorts so i thought it would be a good and once again that's what i that that um positioning the old with the new is something mm -hmm. that's very very important to me and so um i'd like that and i don't know if i answered the question but yeah. that's that those are my thoughts around that now, I love that specific example from Sojourner because I think that makes it so vivid. Mm -hmm. And I'll just add just so that you have a sense. I know it's so hard to monitor everything. Um, if people have put some questions in chat, I'm only looking at the Q&A. So maybe, Lou, you can add them to Q&A. Um, Courtney Reed Eaton is referring to the washerwomen discussion. And she says it's significant to think about washerwomen as some of the first labor organizers in this moment of resuscitated labor movements. And she's glad to have learned about this history through your work. Mm, thank you, Courtney. Thank you so much. Um, that is a big, you know, uh, there are so many tributaries to that story. And I guess that's a, a part of the kind of um, the, the challenge because there's, there's the stuff about the labor movement. There's the stuff about my family. There's a big thread around mothers. I cannot tell you how many times people are reduced to tears when I start talking about washerwomen because they remember their mothers and their grandmothers. The first time I, I was on a, a phone call with Skip Gates talking about the project and he just had to sit there and he became 12 again talking about his grandmother mm. and how he remembers her, you know, with the, the, the crank washing machine and then hanging up on the, it is a deep cultural memory. And so, um, that is that that there's just so much there there's just so much there and the labor part is a big and important part of that 
and um, we have to unearth all of the things. Yeah, and I think the, the power of your work is that you allow us to understand history through these incredibly detailed you know, personal details, that crank, right, that I can literally see because you just put it in my head and I feel something thinking about the kind of work that that involves. And it's just, it's a, it's a really important and under, I think, explored aspect of what makes good history. Uh -huh. And you're sharing so much of it with us today. So I'm grateful. Well, we have a also, oh, sorry, go ahead. One, we are tasked with, as African-American creators, we are, uh, so for some folks, this may occur as popular culture or media or just content creation. But for us, we are creating the archives because there are so many stories that have gone missing that we now have been tasked with piecing those elements back together to be able to create some type of archive of, of sorts that we can then point back to. Can you imagine, you know, the time before Ava DuVernay's 13, you know, where we hadn't been having a conversation about that, you know, so um, it's a way in which and 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 it's a public archive, you know, mm -hmm. so I, there, I make a, a distinction between what what we find in the academy versus where my people sit. And so the places in which my people sit and reside, and reside, there is a need for an archive that's accessible and relatable. And so that's why it's so important for me to, you know, blend those elements of both popular culture and history. Mm -hmm. And we have a question just to tag on to that comment about what is needed to move Washerwoman Project forward. So you can, we can share us a, a a follow-up email if you're not sure at this moment, but. <laughs> well, I know I need, you know, one of the things about, you know, where I am right now, um, it takes so much for me to build out the program at Haytai. Um, so being the festival director and curator of Haytai, um, and it's somewhat, the program is still in its infancy infancy. Mm. And so it takes so much out of me that it's so difficult for me to get back to my own work. And so I'm in the process now of beginning to succession plan. And so I've, mm. I've, I've identified an individual that I am, you know, bringing into the space so that I can ultimately get back to my own work. Well, maybe we can, um, end with this question then around this really important national leadership role you've played as festival director and curator of the Haytai Heritage Film Festival. And you've talked a little bit earlier in the hour about who gets to tell the story and how, especially in the last 15 years, this has become an increasingly central part of the documentary ecosystem. Mm -hmm. But you have a particular passion in developing a black and Southern film ecosystem that has really had legs well beyond the region. And so many artists don't get to see the full production side of leading a cultural institution. And I'm just wondering what are the things you found most important about or rewarding in leading the Haytai Heritage Film Festival? Wow. Now I'm gonna geek out because <laughs> if I go back to the 2021 festival and I'm looking around the Zoom room and in this Zoom room, Mark Anthony Neal, um, and of course, I, in my middle-aged mind, I'm going to forget names, Kevin Wilson, Terrence Nance, um, Charles Burnett. We have a range of, and, and the panel was um, the image of Black males in the South. And so we have a range of leaders and, and experts at their craft having this conversation about, you know, what's important in terms of the telling of the Black Southern male story. Um, things like that, that, those conversations don't happen anywhere else. Mm. Bringing together um, Anjanou Ellis um, also, Shannon Houston, uh, two folks, uh, one of the writers of Lovecraft Country, 
with Omi Shade Bernie Scott, uh, the creator of, of Black Girl's Guide to Surviving Menopause, to talk about the pivotal, the pivotal uh, episode of Lovecraft Country that Anjanu Ellis was in, where she, you know, she's with Josephine Baker and blah, 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 blah. And um, putting, you know, and once again, talking about the historical along with where we are now in terms of being middle-aged women and the expression of who we are and being able to see these, these mm -hmm. people who are invested in that kind of conversation, it doesn't happen anywhere else. So curating those kinds of conversations is just an absolute joy. But uh, the festival differs in the sense that we're, we don't care about red carpets. We don't care about, you know, the next, uh, big Hollywood blockbuster, what we care about is craft. And so being able to create opportunities for, for makers to develop their craft in workshops mm -hmm. and work in progress programs, that has been an absolute joy. You know, but but it's, it's hard work and it comes at a cost, it comes at a price. And so uh, we've got to figure out how this thing is going to be sustainable. Mm -hmm. Well, you said it doesn't happen anywhere else, but I noticed it happened in New York with Red Hot and Cool because you were there too. And I noticed that it happened in 2002 with Unchained Memories. So um, we'll go ahead and I don't know, Lou, if you can link to those two YouTube films in the um, chat so people have access to those. Those are just extraordinary. Also kind of conversations where you brought together some just simply extraordinary creatives um, and watched mind-bendingly important work unfold. Um, and in all of those cases, you're really fostering a path-breaking intergenerational conversation. And I just, I find it so exciting to have, um, for you to have fostered so many of those kinds of pivotal moments, uh, creative moments um, in the region, for the region, but also beyond. And, 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 and now I get to pass it on to the next generation. <laughs> So, you know, uh, One Nine, for example, One Nine is a talented filmmaker and he made this uh, documentary a few years ago uh, called Time is Illmatic and it's all about Nas and uh, it's been award winning. So just remembering that, you know, that that next generation is coming through and you never know when somebody is going to just drop a seismic bomb and just like change things. And, you know, I'm so proud of Chikwe, who um, just did the genius uh, documentary series on Kanye West. Um, you know, they were kids when I was in New York. And so being able to, to, to talk to them, you never know how uh, what you have to share is going to land. And so now it can, it's also a give and take at this point. They're my colleagues. And so we're having conversations about what's next and, you know, techniques and how are we going to do this? So it's, um, it's a beautiful thing. Wow. I'm so grateful to have the time to look through this enormous, powerful, complex body of work and the, the beauty and thoughtfulness that is your consciousness that weaves throughout it. Lana Garland, thank you so much for, for your work, for being with us here today to discuss it. I'm so grateful, so honored to be a colleague and friend and thankful to the FSPs and Duke, Duke Libraries for, for hosting this conversation here today. Thank you so much for everybody that showed up. Um, and, and Lana- and I'd just like to also publicly thank FSP as well. Uh, FSB has been a sponsor of the Hey Thai Heritage Film Festival. And so we cannot, and you and your uh, leadership of the Center for Doc Studies have also supported immensely uh, the film festival. So thank you, all of you, for all that you do. Lana, it's been terrific. Thanks so much. And thanks, everybody.